Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello, my name is Andrew Dudley and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm the chair of the uh, People and Nature Forum, where we focus on the, the connection between people and nature, with a particular focus on the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. Today, we're speaking with Ian Aberna, author of Outlaw Journey Across the Last Untamed Frontier. Welcome, Ian. How are you doing today? How are you? I'm good. Excellent. So, uh, so Ian, what inspired you to write such a groundbreaking book and, and set up the Outlaw Ocean Project? So I, I was on staff for about 17 years at the New York Times. And, you know, my mandate was as an investigative reporter. So I would do big stories or series. And I wrote a series for the paper for about two years called The Outlaw Ocean. And uh, that was about eight big stories about crimes at sea. Uh, and um, you know, it just seemed like a space that two thirds of the planet that's water that rarely gets covered by journalists. And having worked out there prior to becoming a journalist, I knew there were really good stories, a lot of them fairly dark uh, that were worth uh, reporting on. So we, we wrote that story, those series, and, and then um, I decided to continue uh, with it two more years uh, by producing a book. And, and what has been the reception from governments and the global fishing industry to, to your work? Mixed. I mean, uh, we're going on seven years now, you know, um, uh, and dozens and dozens of stories. And so the, the, the true answer to the question is story specific, you know. So the reaction, um, for example, to the reporting we did about sea slavery and the Thai fishing fleet, you know, that, that was a very strong uh, hit on the Thai government at the time. This was 2015 when we put that story out initially, um, and the reaction was as a sense of alarm and um, an engagement. And then over the course of the next two years, uh, we worked with the Thai government. I went back to Thailand, did further reporting, and produced the chapter in the book. Um, and so the sort of reaction subsequently from the Thai government, just as one example, um, was one of sort of um, uh, constructive um, engagement, uh, and a lot of reforms came out of the reporting. Other other stories, you know, I think we're going to discuss one of them. You know, a murder case that we looked into uh, that really implicates the Taiwanese government. Um, the reaction was quite different. A sort of um, uh, you know stone wall of silence um, to that reporting. Um, but ultimately prosecutions after seven years. So it really varies topic by topic. Okay, thank you. Can you take us through what has led to the oceans being such a lawless place? You know, we kind of think of the economic exclusion zones we can see kind of from the coast out to sea, but maybe we don't necessarily think further than that, you know, out into the oceans and, and, and you know, what has happened to make it the way it is today. Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, when I talk about the outlaw ocean, um, I'm speaking quite especially about um, sort of extra legal behavior that occurs to a large degree on the high seas. So outside of national jurisdiction beyond the 200 mile mark typically. Um, and um, quite often what happens is uh, there are egregious behaviors, uh, arms trafficking, human slavery, murder, intentional dumping, abusive stowaways, these sorts of things um, that happen. And bad things happen on land too. But the distinction here is that the level of impunity, the lack of investigation, the sort of anemia of law enforcement out there on the seas is really what's most distinct about um, that space from, from land. You know, bad things happen on land, but usually there are investigations and prosecutions, there's jurisdiction, you know, people get in, involved. Out there when bad things happen, it's, it's far less um, common that there's follow-up investigation prosecution. 
Understood. So I understand you spent uh, about four years out at sea doing the research for this book, and you have a few pictures to to talk us through. So we're just going to bring up the first picture, uh, which I believe is the uh, the sinking of the thunder. Can you tell us a little bit more about what transpired to this? Yes, I mean this was a story. It was sort of an epic tale of of what came to be known as the the longest. Whether this is true or not, this is what law enforcement was saying at the time. The sort of longest law enforcement chase in nautical history, and it didn't involve law enforcement, which is a curious sentence, right? If you think about it. Um, uh, so this was um, a situation in which you had um, a ship called the Thunder, which is what you see sinking there. This ship had a long uh, an illustrious career in, engaged in um, illegal behavior, largely illegal fishing, but also human trafficking and dumping. Um, uh, it had gone over a decade of illegal, illegally fishing quite often in the Southern Ocean near Antarctica. Uh, and uh, routinely, uh, even though it was added to what's called the Interpol Purple List, which is a sort of arrest on site list, um, uh, no one uh, and ports around the world really would exert authority and detain the vessel. So it was engaged very openly in illegal activity. This con ocean sort of conservation group that many people know, some don't, called Sea Shepherd, um, which is, an, is sort of direct action, more radical, more aggressive version of Greenpeace. Um, uh, that has a fleet around the world decided it was time to sort of highlight this problem whereby you have illegality happening in plain sight and no one's doing anything about it. And they, and they decided they were going to find the vessels on this purple list, wherever they were in the, in the world, and then they were going to shadow them and chase them and sort of raise a clamor around them as those vessels attempted to offload their ill-gotten catch, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the thunder topped that list because it had caught you know over 60 million dollars worth of um illegal fish over the course of a decade and so sea shepherd found the thunder nets in the water in the southern ocean um and then began to chase it and the thunder ran for a total of 110 days over tens of thousands of miles um and uh we were my team and i were, were lucky enough to get tipped off about this sort of epic chase that was happening and we found a way to get on board it and to report about it. And ultimately, as you see here, spoiler alert, the, the captain of the Thunder um, decided to sink his own vessel off the coast of Sao Tome Principe, an African country, um, ostensibly to scuttle the evidence on board that he'd been involved in uh, misbehavior. It didn't work. Um, the captain and his officers were arrested incarcerated, the crew was sent home. But this was the case that sort of showed, in, in my view, uh, the outlaw ocean. On the one hand, you had this extra legal player in the form of Sea Shepherd who operates in the gray area or outside the law as sort of conservation vigilantes. And on the other side, you had these very decided, well-documented illegal actors who had gotten away scot-free scot for, for many years. It just summed it up perfectly for our purposes. And, and I had the chance to interview Paul Watson, the, the founder of Sea Shepherd, several months ago. And he was telling me that when this boat, when they actually scuttled it, they put a Mayday call out. And of course, the only vessel in the area was the Sea Shepherd. Were you on board at the time when they when they got when they rescued the guys off the boat? I was not. I had left a week earlier. I'd been on board for quite a while and, and flew home. And I was actually on my way home when I got a call from the captain, Peter Hammerstead. Um, and he said, hey, you're not going to believe what's going on right now in front of me. Um, but that's quite right, you know, as, as Paul um, describes, uh, the captain of the Thunder said that they were sinking and they needed rescue. And indeed the two Sea Shepherd vessels that had been trailing them engaged in a rescue and, and scooped up uh, the crew and the officers. I, I should imagine that was quite a tense moment for everyone involved. Yeah, quite so. Yeah, there was a, there was a real standoff between the captain of the Thunder and the captain of, uh, of the Sea Shepherd ship, in that mm -hmm. case, Peter Hammerstead. Um, and Sid Chakravarti were the two captains, um, and the, the Thunder captain, you know, was very self-righteous and, and wanted to be respected, and, and the Sea Shepherd captains um, were trying to engage in a rescue and not a law enforcement action, but nonetheless, they were rescuing the people that they'd spent uh, three months chasing. Mm -hmm. 
if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll move on to the next photograph. Sure. Okay. So this is um, a vessel off the coast of Gambia. Um, and this is um, a line of reporting that we did uh, for the New Yorker magazine. This was a piece that was looking at um, the sort of complicated story of fish meal and um, the sort of upside down nature of where we are with ocean conservation <clears throat> in that historically um, fish farming, aquaculture on land or near shore, um, uh, um, uh, raising of capture of fish, you know, for the for the market, was historically meant to slow ocean depletion. You know, we're, the, the ocean was running out of fish, and so maybe we should start raising fish for the market. Um, and that made a lot of sense um, until the market began turning it into big business, and so as to grow those fish, whether they're shrimp or salmon or whatever they are. Um, uh, to fatten them up faster, these high protein supplements are used. And the high protein supplements are, turns out, wild caught fish that are ground up, pelletized, and turned into powder. So you have wild caught, meaning in the ocean fish, being caught so as to feed land based fish to go to market, all part of a mission that historically was meant to slow down the capture of wild caught fish. So it's obviously an upside down cycle we have here. And, and this story was meant to take a look at that problem, you know, the use of fish meal. Mm -hmm. And we went to Gambia, West African country, uh, because there's a huge boom in these fish meal factories where massive, often foreign trawlers, in this case, this is a Chinese vessel, are trawling the seas along West Africa and pulling huge amounts of fish out of uh, the, the sort of flow, um, grounding them up for the sake of export. And the local uh, fishers, um, African communities that used to rely on those very same fish for subsistence are now running into major problems because they can't afford to catch what they need to feed their families. And this, uh, this reporting was um, taking a look at that problem. Okay, and if we can move to the next picture, please. So this is um, a, a night shot of a ship um, that was, again, a Chinese vessel, on, a chip fishing vessel, a pear trawler that was headed into North Korean waters. This is an investigation we did um, a year and a half ago in partnership with NBC News. Uh, and essentially, it was a, an attempt to solve two mysteries that had long existed in the East Sea or the Sea of Japan. So this is the body of water, you know, between Russia and North and South Korea, Japan, um, this sort of body of, of water. <clears throat> there were two big mysteries in that body of water. One was why when squid everywhere else in the world as a, as a stock in one place, dozens of bodies annually washing up, these are North Korean fishermen um, washing up on Japanese shores in these decrepit broken down boats. The going, the, the theory had been, well, the squid stock is disappearing because of climate change and those numbers are falling because the squid have moved elsewhere. And the other theory was the dead fishermen is because North Korea is on the ropes and these are, it's a very poor struggling nation and the fuel is dirty, the boats are old and the guys are desperate and they're going out too far from sea, they're stalling and they're dying. Okay, those two theories are not wrong, but they, they didn't seem to explain fully what was happening in those waters. What we learned uh, preliminarily with help, huge help from an organization called Global Fishing Watch was that there seemed to be a massive fishing fleet on the order of about 1,000 1, boats in North Korean waters. These were huge industrial ships in North Korean waters. This was, these were foreign vessels. This was extremely striking because post-2017, after the nuclear situation in, in North Korea, there, there were UN sanctions put on North Korea and unanimously signed by the Security Council, China included, no foreign vessels were allowed to fish in North Korean waters. And here we had dots on a map, satellite found of a thousand Chinese boats in North Korean waters. 
And so the theory was that there's an inundation of these industrial vessels in those waters, in North Korean waters. And that's why North Korean fishermen are getting pushed out. And that's why the fish stock, the squid stock is, is crashing. We took a team, a team there to sort of corroborate the dots on a map theory, you know, what the satellite data seemed to be indicating. And we bought our way onto a South Korean fishing vessel, took a team out to the coordinates where we thought we would catch the Chinese going into North Korean waters and waited. And lo and behold, there they came, you know, uh, a line of them. And, and this is one of those vessels on its way into North Korean waters. And that reporting revealed what came to be known as the, the largest illegal fishing fleet ever discovered. It was those thousand Chinese boats. Thank you, Ian. So we're going to move to a short video, which we must warn viewers is extremely explicit and depicts a scene of uh, murder of seafarers. So we just play this really quickly and we're going to ask you, Ian, what exactly has happened here. So obviously extremely, uh, this, is, it, is it finished the video? Yeah, so yeah, very distressing video to watch, obviously, Ian, and, and really shows the worst of the of what can happen at sea. But can you tell us the backstory to how this video was found and, and how you were able to investigate what had happened? So this video was, was brought to me by a source who is in law enforcement and knew I was looking into stories of crimes at sea. The video um, uh, had murky context to it. What was known, you know, the, let's sort of establish the parameters of the video. The video is a 10 minute and 26 second long video that was shot on a cell phone. It um, depicts over the course of those 10 minutes, four, at least four, maybe six to eight men who are in what look to be you know, high seas or, or pretty far off from shore waters. They're clinging to what looked to be wooden wreckage in the water. And off camera, you're hearing a semi-automatic weapon or maybe two firing on them. And in, over the course of the 10 minutes, you, you watch as five men are killed you know, with headshots. Um, and the, as disturbing as that is, uh, even more disturbing is that is that at the end of the video, um, what looked to be either witnesses or maybe culprits or both um, pose for selfies on camera and celebrate the sort of carnal killing that just unfolded. And these men all seem to be standing on an industrial um, vessel. Okay. So the, these are the basics that you can discern just from watching the video. The other thing you can clearly discern is no matter what preceded what you're seeing on camera, even if what preceded was the guys in the water were pirates who were attacking this fishing vessel, when the video is rolling, those guys in the water are unarmed and no longer a threat. So you have a clear case of murder. It's hard to you know, in any court of law argue that this is self-defense or anything other than murder. So you have a murder video, you have culprits or witnesses celebrating, you have their face on camera, and this is sent to me. So I think as an investigative reporter, when I get it, okay, well, this is exactly the kind of story I should be able to crush, you know, um, if, I, if I spend enough time investigating who are the guys in the water, who are the guys firing the guns, what ship is this on, where is the water that this is happening, what led up to it, you know, et cetera. We spent a year at the New York Times working on it, put something on the front page. We figured out that the guys doing the shooting were on a Taiwanese tuna longliner. There are three ships at the scene, all part of the same fleet. They're all sort of circling these guys in the water. Um, and that's about as far as we got. When I put the investigation down, another pretty impressive, intrepid investigator picked it up. He was in, in collaboration with uh, Nat Geo. Um, he spent another year um, working on the case. He unearthed a bunch more information. 
when he put it down, I picked it back up, um, you know, a couple of years later, put a piece about a year and a half ago on the front page of the Washington Post. And sort of that back and forth ultimately culminated in the um, enough pressure being brought to bear on the Taiwanese government and their prosecutor's office to um, arrest the captain of the ship where the shooters were, um, prosecute him, and he was sentenced to 26 years in prison uh, last year. That's great news, and, and thank God you were able to, to bring them to justice. So you've worked with several organizations, such as the Stella Maris Catholic Nuns, to rescue what in, in, in effect are sea slaves. How, how difficult are the challenges facing these organizations? They're huge. I mean, th these organizations that specialize in anti-trafficking work, um, quite especially aimed at seafarers, or service providing in general, there's a huge problem of abandonment and stranding of seafarers, which is not a trafficking situation, but it's no less egregious and can ruin people's lives. And on any given day, there are hundreds of cases of, of mariners who are stuck someplace and they have no way to get home and they have no way to leave their ship and you know, no one's answering their phone. And there are this, this small handful of organizations that really specialize in trying to troubleshoot those situations, whether it's you know uh, Cambodian deckhands who've been trafficked across the border into Thailand and and sort of captively via debt bondage or even shackled you know onto Thai trawlers, um, and then they jump ship and try to flee. There are organizations that try to help them get away, or you know. Um, mariners on oil cargo ships that get stuck in the port of UAE and the captain is uh, the owner of the vessel has cut his losses and stops returning calls and declares bankruptcy and those guys on board are stuck they have no way to get back to Indonesia or wherever they're from these organizations work on those cases and they tend to be underfunded you know maybe three four men or women in in an office near the port with a small budget and you know kind of a lot of persistence, and they're constantly pressuring the government, the unions, um, the insurers, the flag states, the ship owners to do right by these folks. Uh, and they're really heroic, I, I have to say. These organizations are really unsung heroes in this space. Exactly. And when you look at, obviously, got this one side of it is the fishing that we've we've just been discussing, but one real eye-opening story for myself was uh, involved in uh, princess cruises and their use of these magic pipes. Can you take us through what happened with those guys? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's this striking statistic that we came across when reporting the series, which is that in the course of every three years, ships around the world collectively intentionally dump more oil than the Exxon Valdez and BP spills combined. So for all the news coverage, myself included at the New York Times, like that gets paid to um, spills, which are these tragic, huge events. And, you know, for good reason, there's far less attention to the, dis to the intentional dumping and release of oil because it tends to be a slow moving phenomena, disparate, discreet, and ubiquitous, you know? And so it doesn't, it doesn't have the dramatic um, newsworthiness of the BP spill, you know, a singular big event, acute event. Um, and so I wanted to sort of tell that other uh, chronic non-acute story, you know, of intentional dumping. And to, to, to tell that story is to look at, you know, um, the phenomena of the magic pipe. The magic pipe is this concept um, um, method whereby, you know, ship operators um, do a sort of uh, crass business calculation and look at the economics of what it costs to dispose of the waste matter on these ships. And if you're talking about a cruise ship, it's huge amounts of oil and runoff. Um, and how they're supposed to process it and dispose of it is they bring it in shore and they offload it and it costs a pretty penny to deal with it by regulation. Alternatively, you have your engineer install a quote unquote magic pipe, which essentially is a tube that goes underneath the ship and you flush the stuff when no one's looking. And that's a much cheaper way to get rid of it. And you have this sort of um, 
excuse in your head that, well, dilution is real, the oceans are huge, and what does my little litter here, liquid litter, really do to harm the ocean? But the stuff accumulates, and there's a lot of it happening all the time. And, and so we wanted to look at that um, phenomena, and we looked at a, a big ticket instance of it, which was Carnival Cruise Company had their engineers on uh, one, at least one ship, likely multiple install magic pipes and dispose of waste um, in that fashion. And they got caught and they you know, faced um, at the time, the largest civil penalty ever levied against a shipping company, against a cruise company. And what, what was the dollar amount of the fine that they received? Do you know? I, I'm doing this from recall and it's been a while, but I think it was 40 million. Wow. It was okay. big, yeah. And that was in the Department of Justice, was it? Yeah, I mean, this was interesting because the um, engineer who blew the whistle was Scottish, if I don't, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. And the ship, um, when he discovered it, was off the coast of the UK, but it was bound for US waters. And I'm doing uh, this by recall. Um, uh, the US has really aggressive laws on these issues, including laws that um, incentivize whistleblowers, you know, by giving them a portion of the, of the, of the penalties. Um, and so I don't think the whistleblower did it for the, the finances. And I'm not sure if he even ever took the money, but he, I think he knew that if he blew the whistle in U S waters, there was a much better chance that the coast guard there was going to carry it all the way through because there was a long history of the prosecutor's office in the U S mm -hmm. tackling those crimes. Uh, and so that's exactly what they did. I find it amazing that a what a billion dollar corporation is is cutting corners like this. So you must have been shocked yourself when you learned about it. You know, um, yes and no. I mean, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, oftentimes there's a culture created um, that puts pressures um, that have unintended consequences. And so if I had to guess here from a corporate level, what happened there, there were huge corporate pressures placed on efficiency and savings. So you need to hurry up and get that vessel in and out of port in no less than X days. And that pressure trickles down to captains who realize that they're gonna, their career is gonna be affected, their bottom line is gonna be affected if they don't hit those markers. And so then they start, turning to their engineer and saying, hey, look, we can't wait for an extra three days for the stuff to get unloaded properly because we're gonna get in trouble with the bosses. We need to speed things up, so make it go away. And you can see the trickle down effect so that the corporate high are not saying, hey, put in a magic pipe, but mm -hmm. they are putting on pressures that end up having the consequence of these sorts of corners being cut. And everyone's to blame from the engineer all the way up to the CEO for what, what results. If I had to guess, I think that's probably what went down. Just to switch gears a little bit, in the book you talk about spending extended time in silence and experiencing what seafarers refer to as the soul whispers. Would you be willing to share a few of the, the thoughts that you had in those moments? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if I could recall them, I would. I, th I think it's not the specifics of the moment. I think that... Um, it's the clarity and endurance of the voice, by, by which I mean, I think in, in my normal daily life here on land, you're overwhelmed with the pace of interactions, the amount of interactions, be they face-to-face -face or on your phone, the number of emails and texts, and just sort of like the constant flow of information and, and pulls on your attention and your decision-making and thought process you head out to outer space, namely the high seas, right? And suddenly you're out of touch with the world and that's bad and good. And the good is that um, you have these long periods of time where you're not getting that pull on your attention. The interesting consequence for me personally is that um, the sort of ADD, the attention deficit disorder nature of my focus on land um, calm down and I could sit and have a conversation with myself in my own head that actually was sustainable. You know, I could think things through seven chess moves down the board. Um, 
Whereas on land, I, I, I could never do that. And those are the whispers and the conversation that I think that space sometimes affords you. And, and that's sort of the difference of um, how you start to think and behave a little bit uniquely when you're out there for a long time. We've obviously covered a lot of issues. And as you mentioned before, they, they could be quite dark, but in closing, I'd like to end on a positive note and ask you what unique and memorable experiences you, you took from traveling the planet's ocean so extensively. Well, many, I mean, the, the heroism of the very people you asked about before, these mm -hmm. sort of um, anonymous, you know, advocates in lots of places around the world that are doing um, incredible, daring, sometimes quite brave work um, was quite inspiring. Uh, and time and again, I was running into them. Um, I think the sense of marvel um, and kind of the awe that you have um, when you're really so far from land and just sort of a, a respect for um, how powerful nature can be. Um, and how freakishly beautiful things are out there, you know, strange creatures, you know, fish that are flying in the sky and birds that are, you know, fly, swimming underwater and, you know, photoluminescent species that make the light, you know, the, the, the water light up in the middle of the night and, you know, killer whales attacking sperm whales and these epic kind of Clash of the Titan style battles at sea. I mean, it's just the stuff of, marvel comics in some ways and there it is right in front of you it's rare to be lucky enough to see that stuff and so um i really feel lucky to have gotten the chance to go out there and then at the same time to be able to try to tell stories that may in some small way help correct some of the problems or protect people that otherwise don't have a voice and what advice do you give us and, and kind of what concrete steps can we take to improve life for seafarers and the health of our planet's oceans? Well, I mean, you know, so the reporting we do is meant to broaden the taxonomy of what people think about when they think of bad stuff at sea, you know, crime at sea. Um, so I think um, historically and, and to a large degree, Hollywood driven when you say maritime crime, people think of Captain Phillips style Somali piracy or the BP spill or ocean plastic. You know, these are things that are conjured up because there've been big campaigns or big cultural moments around them. What I wanted to do was raise the awareness of all the other things that are happening out there so that there's a more accurate sense of the diversity of, of um, problems that need to be solved. To answer your question, I would say, don't get overwhelmed by the by you know by the sheer breadth of those problems and depth of them. Um, you know, uh, just choose the ones that most speak to you, and then double down in small ways that you, as an average person, a taxpayer, a donor, a person, an interlocutor that talks with your kids or your spouse, you know, um, or your workplace about these issues, how you vote, um, uh, you know. All of these are how you buy stuff, you know, what you purchase and taking a little time to think about, maybe I shouldn't buy that because I've read that, you know, it's it's on the worst end of concerns about slavery or, or illegal fishing. So just in small ways, trying to, to use your various different roles to help um, tackle some, some issue that's a part of it that, that speaks to you. Thank you. So uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in and for the viewers who would like to ask a question and now's the time to, to just let us know. And we'll put that question to Ian. But one of the questions is, how do you prepare mentally for, for your kind of trips and long uh, stays out in the oceans? Um, well, it, it sort of depends. If I'm going on a vessel that's a really well-stocked vessel, U.S. Coast Guard or Doctors Without Borders or Sea Shepherd, you know, um, the preparation is, is not as hard. If I'm headed to South Korea to head toward North Korean waters on a, you know, buying my way onto a South Korean squid ship, okay, you got to think carefully about your preparations there or, you know, a Thai trawler looking for sea slaves. You're going to be in very rough conditions and you've got to think carefully about your tech, you know, um, 
the technology you want to have on you so that if you fall overboard, you know, you're tracking technology and sort of a security plan, um, your sort of own hygienic tech, you know, kind of your, your kit when it comes to just ensuring that, you know, on a lot of these vessels, for example, on the South China Sea, um, eating with people is a, is a, is an entry point to get to know them and sitting down with other deckhands and eating what they've prepared for you is an intimate moment. It's, it's a moment of access to them. You definitely don't want to turn that up. At the same time, you're, you're rolling the dice uh, on food poisoning, you know, um, and if you get food poisoning and you've got three more weeks out there, it's a big problem. You know, you're, you're going to be in, in bad shape and there often aren't meds on board. So making sure that you um, have food of your own, you know, like little stockpiles of high protein, this or that, vitamins, med kit, um, uh, good tech in case you need to call for help, et cetera, backup batteries, solar panels, these sorts of things. Uh, and then I often have a pretty disciplined ritual on how I structure my time so that I um, don't uh, lose track of, of um, my relationship with uh, what I want to get done. You know, how much do I write, making sure I work out in the morning, getting enough sleep, not working too hard. Uh, not spending too much time in the sun. All these things I kind of police very carefully because one wrong move and you can end up um, uh, sick. Yeah. And another question is, uh, what about piracy and, and militant takeover of other ships? Is this a threat to the environment? Well, I mean, th these are the, the question has very broad terms. So one would want to narrow the terms a little bit to answer it in a way that um, is substantive. So, you know, th there's piracy and there's piracy. Um, and if we're talking about um, armed thuggery, you know, whether its goal is to kidnap and ransom people or board and take uh, and then get lost. Um, okay, well, um, th that the relationship between that sort of crime and um, the environment is is a dialectic, right? You know, one feeds the other and the other feeds one. Um, they feed off each other, which is to say, you look at places like the coast of West Africa or the, or the coast of East Africa, like Somalia, and you'll see that a huge driver of that kind of criminality, at least at the outset, was overfishing you know, near shore, whereby the ability of fishermen um, to, you know, feed their families and make a buck um, bottomed out because often foreign vessels, industrial vessels, rake those waters clean. And so at least in the early stages of Somalia, um, you know, a new business model came up, which is, hey, we know how to work the waters. We've got boats. We know the routes. We know where people are coming. Well, there are no fish to be had, but there's some, you know, guys to rob and we can make some really good money. And so in the early days, that was a business model. It soon became something else entirely. Um, but um, there are real relationships between overfishing and the insecurity that that causes and other forms of crime like piracy. And how can people support your work moving forward? Can you, do you accept donations? Yeah, I mean, we do. I mean, we fund all of our stories usually in two ways one we apply to big philanthropies for big you know support and then two and overwhelmingly from small individual you know donors who um, go to the website there's a donate button and they you know give five bucks or whatever it is um, because they think the journalism is worthy we really believe in funding our own stories partially because once we produce it the way we want to produce it and up to the standard we want, then we take it to the Washington Post or BBC or The Economist or wherever it is. And we say, hey, look, we've got this incredible reporting and it's free to you if you want to run it um, because people have helped us make that possible, but you can't own it. So you can run it in The Economist, but we're going to translate it into Chinese and Spanish and French. And we're going to run it in a lot of other places because our goal is to get it seen globally by more people. And if you lock it down in The Economist, only The Economist readers are gonna see it. So we've sort of struck this new model that lives on donations from, from viewers. 
Just in, in chapter 11, you have a you know, quote by Ian Rankin, which says you, you wouldn't think we could kill an ocean. And you go on to explore kind of the logic of trying to save the planet while ignoring two thirds of it. What, what's kind of your, your view on this is, you know, are people becoming more aware of the importance of the ocean's play in the midst of the climate crisis? I think they are. I mean, I think um, in the last, as long as I've been on this beat, if you will, for the last nine years, um, I've seen a huge shift in just in my realm in journalism. You know, you, 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 there were no ocean reporters for whom that was the beat. Um, and to the extent that there were environmental reporters who covered fish issues or marine issues, mm -hmm. they covered those issues typically as environmental stories, right? Um, there are a bunch of problems with that in my view, and there need to be reporters that are covering that space, but covering it as a human story and an environment story always together. And there need to be a whole lot more reporters out there doing that for the public to become fluent and, and concerned. You know, um, there are, you know, there, in the last several years alone, the AP and the Guardian and a bunch of other places, legacy institutions have invested in um, reporters just working on this stuff. And, and that's fantastic. Um, so I think that's, that's progress. Does it live up to, you know, if you think about 50 million people, over 50 million people work in this space and water covers two thirds of the planet. If you think about those 50% of the air we believe comes from the oceans, if you think about the statistics, you know, um, and then you look at the, the role that's played in the overall discussion about the climate crisis, there's a huge disparity there still. And um, while I think we're moving in the right direction, I don't think we're close to covering it enough. So I was shocked to read the story about uh, your experience in Libya when you were on, on the phone to your wife and you got kind of uh, arrested by the, the secret police and you had to get rescued after the intervention of the, the US State Department. What, what happened there? So I took a team, um, the Yellow Ocean Project took a team. I, it was me and, and three other uh, journalists who work for me. Uh, we went to Libya to take a close look at um, EU policies supporting um, the Libyan Coast Guard in the effort of stopping migrants from reaching Europe. These migrants are trying to cross the Mediterranean. Um, we were looking, I was reporting in Tripoli with the team, uh, looking at a murder at a migrant detention center. We had a visa to be in the country. Obviously you can't, um, you know, Libya is a war zone and you can't be a reporter there without permission from the government and you can't move around without armed security. Um, we had a very successful run, maybe too successful of reporting. And on the seventh day, um, I was in my hotel room, like you said, uh, eight o'clock Sunday night, debriefing with my wife. I had a lot of work, so I didn't go with the other three who headed out to dinner with armed security. Uh, knock on the door, about a dozen armed men come into the hotel room, hood me, um, uh, then, you know, beat me for a while, break some ribs and do some other pretty severe damage, and then drag me hooded out of the hotel, put me in a car and take me to a secret prison. The three others were similarly hit by the same militia um, uh, called the Libyan Intelligence Service or Al Nawasi. The same squad hit them in the middle of an intersection, very surgical um, attack on their armed convoy hooded them, also took them to the same prison. And we were held there at that prison for the next seven days, six and a half days. Um, again, luckily for us, uh, my wife was on the phone with me and heard the violence or part of it. And she immediately triggered an emergency plan. Uh, and um, the US State Department um, kind of swung into action and began applying pressure on the Libyan president, Libyan attorney general to find us and release us. And um, ultimately we were released and, and evacuated out of the country. Wow, well, thank God you're safe. And uh, you know, thank you to your family as well for the, you know, the sacrifice they make in you traveling so much abroad. And so, so what's next? What's next on your agenda or your calendar? I believe you're headed to the Falkland Islands soon. Yeah, we're working on a, a series about um, the Chinese distant water fishing fleet, you know, um, the Chinese distant water fleet globally is hands down the largest fishing fleet on the planet. You know, 
it's bigger than the next three largest fleets combined. And the largest portion of that fleet is the squid fishing fleet, you know, feeding the, the world calamari market, you know, to a large degree. A lot of very worrisome things are happening in different places, you know, sea slavery and murder and dumping and overfishing and UN sanctions violations and the like. And so we're working on a series of taking a look at those myriad concerns. And the first part of that reporting um, will be in the high seas waters northwest of the Falkland Islands, uh, where there's a huge cluster of um, these squid vessels fishing and we're gonna go um, see what they're up to. And, and how long do you think you'll be away for this for this trip? Uh, this will be about a month, uh, month long reporting trip. Okay, wow. And I guess my last question uh, for you is that in the book, you mentioned that you, there were some stories you couldn't get into the book. You had to leave them aside. Was Could you share what one story with us that, that wasn't included? Well, I mean, truth be told, the two big stories that I didn't tackle in the book that felt embarrassing to not have tackled. You're writing a book about lawlessness of the sea and you don't touch the Chinese and you don't touch the Mediterranean crisis. So those two stories, you know, you know, tens of thousands of migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean, many of them being killed, many of them being incarcerated in a war zone, um, that felt incredibly urgent. And it was, a, it was an outlaw ocean story because a lot of the most nefarious things that are happening are happening at sea and, dis, and because they could, you can get away with it at sea. You know, countries, the EU and Libya are able to do things offshore that they probably couldn't get away with elsewhere. Um, so those two stories, you know, like you said, the Libya story ran in the New Yorker in December, and that was a year long investigation. So we got that done. Um, and next we're turning to China um, this year. The other big stories that I, I are on my bucket list, um, seabed mining, I think is a really urgent um, story on the horizon, you know, kind of the mining of precious metals that are going to be used in long lasting batteries and solar panels and the like, and sort of, you, you know, accessing the seafloor and what concerns might there be for that or necessity. Um, I also would like, we're planning on taking a really good look at a fish meal more. I talked about that in Gambia, but really looking a whole lot more at that because that's 50%, roughly 50% of all marine life pulled from the ocean get turned into fish meal. It's a crazy statistic. You know, it's a huge amount of biomass. Um, uh, so those are those are um, my priorities for the next 24 months. You're going to be very busy by the sounds of it, for sure. So we, we hope you stay safe. And we wish again to thank you for uh, giving us the time today to learn more about your work. And uh, we wish you the best of luck moving forward. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.